Our first presenter for this panel is uh, W. Cole Wicker, who is a doctoral student at the University of Georgia and the recipient of the University of Georgia's Presidential Graduate Fellowship. He is a public historian with an interest in interpreting race uh, and labor at public recreation sites. Cole holds uh, degrees from Duke University, um, and his talk today is titled Hard Labor Creek State Park, a Case Study in Discriminatory Recreation. Cole? Some good morning, everyone. Uh, quick thank you to the folks at the Georgia State Archives for allowing me to present today. So before I get started, a quick show of hands. How many folks have been to Hard Labor Creek State Park before? Awesome, a great number of hands. So I'm gonna try not to make a fool of myself up here today. Um, but once again, thank you all so much for being here. My interests broadly uh, cover the interpretation of race and labor in public parks. I think public parks offer us this chance as a um, sort of an educational incubator where we can think about grappling with challenging and difficult histories, thinking about education as a tool um, for folks that maybe aren't taking history lessons in the classroom anymore. And so, I'm really interested in how we talk about the past rooted in place, because for many folks outside of the academy, the way that we think of the past or the way that we relate to stories is through individual places. And so rather than giving you a long kind of soliloquy on how hard Labor Creek became a park through certain governmental uh, initiatives, I'll talk a bit about that. I really want to sit kind of in place with hard labor, kind of talk about different decisions that took place over the course of about its 200 year history that really put it in perspective today. And all of that place making history starts with my first foray to Hard Labor Creek State Park. So when I moved to Georgia, I knew that within a couple of days I wanted to be out on the trail again. That's where I find sort of solace. It's where I can uh, be calm. Closest to UGA, Hard Labor Creek was about a 30 minute drive, closest to State Park at least. I had visited years ago in a previous career, so I thought why not go back and really see what it's all about. Quick Google search, I saw that Hard Labor Creek had some CCC trails. At the time I thought, oh, I wanna write about CCC and state parks, bing, bang, boom, why not study it right here? I drive to the park, beautiful drive to Rutledge, and I arrive at its outpost. And for many folks that have visited the park, you've probably been at its kind of kooky little outpost. And there's a sign out front. Uh, it was erected by the Morgan County Historical Association. I read that sign right after I got out of the car and I was really surprised to learn uh, at least according to the sign, that Hard Labor Creek was a national park, or at least it was a national park until 1946. And if anybody here has been to many of our national parks, you know it's kind of funny because Hard Labor Creek does not look like what we would think of as a national park. It's not grand, it's fun, it's pretty, but it's small, it's isolated. It doesn't have the grand vistas that we have out west or the large old growth forest that we might see in the Smokies. Um, I was curious to know more about it. What was this place? How did I not know that Georgia had its own national park in my backyard? Spoiler alert, that wasn't the case, right? This is a um, kind of the first nod to how interpretation at Hard Labor Creek looks a little different. Doesn't quite grapple with its more challenging and difficult histories as a public recreation site. I know many folks have been here, but I think it's always helpful to situate us where Hard Labor Creek is because to be honest, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. It's about 50 miles from us where we sit right now in Rutledge, Georgia, and um, excuse me, in Morgan County. It sits on the border of Morgan and Walton County. It's about 5,000 acres of public land. There's two lakes, there's miles of trails, biking, observatory, uh, lots you can do in Hard Labor Creek. What's important about this location is that it's close to Atlanta. And that might seem obvious, but Hard Labor Creek as a park concept came about in the 1930s during the federal demonstration area program or recreation demonstration area program. We'll talk a bit more about those program specifics, but the idea is that Hard Labor Creek was near an industrial city. It was near a population center and would be an easy place to recreate. You'll hear me reference throughout the 100 mile day distance radius today. What that essentially means is that many of these parks that came about in the 1930s were designed to be accessible to the largest number of people within a day's drive or a 100 mile trip one way. Now, before we talk about its origin as a park, I have to kind of out myself as the biggest, it's the joke, the biggest failure of this presentation, and that's I can't tell you exactly where the name hard labor comes from. I can give you some of its folklores uh, and some of those stories, which I think are important and add to the argument. Uh, but the truth be told, hard labor creeks name predates 
a lot of Georgia's penal history. It's not from a uh, working site or a labor camp. There are a couple of local stories that really kind of unpack what Hard Labor Creek was prior to its role as a public site. Importantly, when you go and talk to interpreters, if you ask them where the name comes from, they give you two answers. The first is an emphatic, we were not a prison camp. So I guess they get that a lot, right? People think that the name is easy to understand. And then they kind of uh, retort with two of the most popular stories in the area. The first is a little simpler than the other. And that is that Hard Labor Creek was once the site of a large plantation and it's named Hard Labor after the um, difficult labor that enslaved persons put in on the banks of the creek. That would make sense. The name comes about, we see it in some maps as early as about 1815, which it was an active plantation and uh, plantation site at that time. There's another popular story that has withstood the test of time, and that is that Hard Labor Creek is named after a anglicized uh, Muscogean word. Uh, when Chief McIntosh crossed Hard Labor Creek in the you know, 17, 1800s, uh, it was flooded, it was challenging. He said it was a hard labor's crossing and made it to the other side. Now, I don't know about y'all, I don't necessarily believe either of those stories. I think there's a little fact in the fiction, but I think both of those stories tell us an important part of understanding how we interpret the legacy of a place like hard labor. And that is that hard labor's past is really rooted in dispossession. It's rooted in whiteness that situates itself on the bank. We see that in terms of folks who settle on the um, Creek or now Muscogee uh, American border in the late 17 and early 1800s. We see it in the dispossession of land uh, and tenant farmers in, 19, in the 1930s. And we see it in who can access this park through the 1960s. After uh, white settlers came and colonizers came to Hard Labor Creek in about 1807, 1811 is when we see the first reports. Uh, very quickly, you see the rise of plantation agriculture. William Stallings owned almost the entirety of the present day boundaries of Hard Labor Creek's land, about 5,000 acres, and enslaved 93 individuals in the 1850s census, putting him at one of the larger plantation owners in the central Georgia Piedmont. So when we think about who Hard Labor Creek served in the past that it tells, we can actually look at some of the land purchase records in the 1930s and see that his direct descendants still own the land, still occupied the land, even when the park service um, came to build the park. And that's really important because when you visit this park today, there's very little interpretive material about what happened in this land, what happened on this land before uh, the park service took over. And I think that's pretty important because when folks are walking the trails, right, all of this park is, is heavily designed, created. You don't see any older trees, old growth trees. It was submarginal farmland, uh, mostly dilapidated by the time the park service stepped in intentionally in the 1930s. But there's still a legacy that needs to be kind of grappled with for folks to really take advantage of what hard labor has to offer. Those are just a couple quick notes about its past that we're not necessarily talking about. After my first visit to Hard Labor Creek, I wanted to return and get to know more. I was very lucky on my second visit to get access to the Hard Labor Creek archive. And if you're wondering what the Hard Labor Creek archive was or is, it's that binder right there, uh, which is, you know, I was really excited to see it. There's lots of photos. Um, there's even this one hand-drawn timeline with no reference source whatsoever, but it has just enough points of material to keep me interested. Uh, and as a quick aside, we can't quite corroborate it just yet, but there's one note that it says Morgan County prisoners were used to build uh, park roads in, 19, in the 1930s. And so raises that question of actually how we talk about uh, carceral labor in the park. That aside, this binder focuses mostly on its CCC heritage. And that's what the park is really interested in talking about nowadays. On a subsequent visit after that first one, I was actually lucky enough to see a few of the remaining CCC structures at Hard Labor Creek. It's one of the few uh, parks in the Southeast that actually have original CCC barracks on the screen next to us. We can actually see the CCC uh, mess hall and infirmary. So the park is like, readily asking itself, how can we interpret this heritage? How can we use these extant structures to actually communicate with the public? With the centennial of the CCC coming up in about 10 years, there's conversation of creating a museum, of putting this sort of public facing material to work really exciting. It raises some important questions, uh, but I don't think it's the only part of the story that we need to tell. To fully understand Hard Labor Creek's legacy, we have to understand what kind of park it was. Hard Labor Creek was approved as the Industrial Rec 
excuse me, Industrial Recreation Demonstration Area Program Act under the 1933 National Recovery Administration or National Recovery Act. Hard Labor Creek is one of 30, about 30 brand new parks formed in the 30s, 3030, um, easy to remember. There are about 50 different sites overall. Some of these were state park extensions. Some of these were new waysides on the Blue Ridge Parkway. Um, but overall, the idea and the goals of these programs were to create accessible parks, accessible recreation areas close to industrialized cities. So you can see on the screen in front of us, most of these sites focus on the um, eastern seaboard, eastern part of the United States. There were only three sort of west of the Mississippi River, one in California, one in Oregon. Lots throughout the south. Um, Pennsylvania, for some reason, had five of its own. But all of these, the one thing that they have in common is that they are exceptionally close to big cities. Hard Labor Creek near Atlanta, Oak Mountain near Birmingham. We have Montgomery Bell near Nashville. We can see that throughout. That pattern makes sense. In the original language of the act, the Federal Emergency Relief Administration released a memo in 1934 that noted that the goal of this program was to convert, um, was the conversion of poor land to other and more proper uses, prevention of misuse by land of land by erosion or other causes, the improvement of economics and social status of families occupying farms, improvement of economic and social status of industrially stranded populations, reducing the cost of local governments um, and local public institutions in supporting that land management and the encouragement of good land use planning. So it makes sense, right? We can get good recreation, we can get people outside. This is in the heart of the depression. It's a New Deal program. It gets people working. Many of these sites uh, were expanded by CCC and WPA labor. Checks all of those boxes. One important problem though, and it's not necessarily going to be surprising, is that when race comes into play, these parks don't uh, support a broad nation. They support one particular type of nation, and this white recreationalist, often the white middle class recreationalist. This is a map that I'm working on that uses uh, historic census data uh, mapped with the population. And one thing that's really important to note, all of those sort of translucent dots are places where the average sort of the population density of people of color falls under the national average at the time of about 11%. The darker dots um, go up by two, three, four time intervals. Hard Labor Creek is the darkest dot on the screen, similar to Oak Mountain and Birmingham and other deep south parks. These are sites that have somewhere between 35 and 44 percent of the driving distance population identified as people of color. Importantly, when you look at that map in 1938, when the parks were largely open across the country, there was one park that readily allowed non-white visitors in Minnesota near St. Croix. There was one park in the south that had one area where people of color could maybe recreate, but jury was out because white locals might push back on it. That was Swift Creek in Virginia. So when you look at this area of the south where a large number of people of color, a large number of black folks lived, uh, there were no readily available recreation opportunities, even in a program designed for their ready access. And this was intentionally built into the recreation demonstration area program. When you look at some uh, records, it's really interesting to see that Hard Labor Creek in its original concept, and I use that air quote intentionally, could have been used as an open, integrated, or even black only park. Some of the earlier documents at the upper level of the uh, Park Service Administration noted that Hard Labor Creek would have been designed as a whites only or a black or colored only park at the time. The exact jury on that decision is still out. Uh, importantly, this decision was well-founded, right? Even when they decided not to allow people of color to visit Hard Labor Creek, the idea of creating a Black-only space near Atlanta was at the top of the list, Atlanta and Baltimore being two cities specifically highlighted as being bereft of recreation opportunities for people of color. Now, I'm here to argue, too, that the Park Service was never going to make Hard Labor Creek a Black-only or a Black-supported space, regardless of what those memos said. That's because of other decisions they made along the way. Hard Labor Creek used white-only CCC labor um, in group camp SP11 and SP8. And what's important about that is they make ready reference that if there was white labor going into this park, only white recreationists, recreationalists could use this park. At neighboring, um, excuse me, Montgomery Bell in Tennessee, you actually have residents up in arms that formerly owned white land 
uh, was being uh, sort of modified by black laborers for a park that was always dedicated as a whites only park. So even the idea of black occupation during the CCC administration was something that would not have been appropriate. And so the decisions by the federal um, government, the National Park Service along the way, reinforced this idea that even though kind of out loud they were saying, oh, maybe Hard Labor Creek could serve this broader population in Atlanta, never really was built for the folks uh, that it argued for. And unsurprisingly, when it finally opened in 1938, the park largely benefited a whites only population. Its publicity materials uh, showcased only white, uh, white Atlantans, white Georgians recreating there. Georgia would not open its uh, first or would not open its only black accessible park until 1950. And so what could have been, um, what seemed like it might have been, ultimately delayed the program, delayed the experience for black Georgians for another um, decade and a half. I think it's also important to think about what Harley Creek talks about today. I'm really interested in interpretation and education. So not just what happened here, but how we're talking about it. Interestingly, if you visit the park, you see a couple CCC signs that talk about the CCC more generally. You don't really see much wrestling with Georgia's specific CCC camps on those interpretive signs. One thing that is a little bit subversive that's underneath everybody's noses is the catchment pond, Lake Brantley, north of the larger Lake Rutledge, named after Lewis Brantley and his family who, as interpreters, interpreters will note, was brutally murdered by Indian Creeks in 1811. I use those air quotes, uh, again, intentionally because the sort of justification and the explanation of that is a bit dated. Uh, Joshua Haynes, a historian, notes that many of these skirmishes and interactions that happen in places like Hard Labor Creek were actually border patrols or border disputes uh, between Creek Muskogee people and white Georgians at the point of land session, um, sort of land boundaries around the land sessions. This site in Georgia was actually one of the top two most visited uh, sort of historic sites in the 50s and 60s. So white Georgians were flocking to Hard Labor Creek to see the site of this quote unquote Indian massacre. And so when thinking about these legacies and the stories that the park chose to tell, it again reiterates that idea that this land was never meant for anybody other than sort of white consumption. So I raised a question and leave with you all today. How do we grapple with these sort of variety of stories, these varieties of interpretations with the legacy of what actually happened at Hard Labor Creek? I think it's interesting that it has this um, sort of robust ability to do something interesting. Uh, Hard Labor Creek and some of its group camps actually show up in different movies like the Friday the 13th film franchise, uh, Fear Street on Netflix. The state thought about using it as a COVID isolation camp. These group camps are still reservable. And if you go and kayak at or canoe at Lake Rutledge, you will see these group camps, people still using them. But we can't just assume that just because the park integrated in the 1960s, just because they don't talk about this legacy, doesn't mean that trauma of the past still isn't there. And so even though it represents a sort of small snapshot in Georgia's history, a smaller snapshot in the public land movement in the uh, United States and the American South, I think it's a good reminder of what happens when we sort of step down, um, look in our backyard and ask the questions about what took place here and how we can talk about that to sort of educate the broader public. So thank you all so much. Our uh, next presenter is Angela Ronick, who is an architectural historian with New South Associates. Um, she holds a BA in American Studies and Art History from Amherst College and a Master of Art History from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. Angela's graduate studies included a focus on American vernacular architecture and landscapes, and her presentation is titled Under the Surface of Lake Lanier. Angela? Hey, everyone. So I'm going to be talking today about the history of Lake Lanier. And for anybody who isn't familiar, I don't want to make any assumptions, although I think you probably um, all are. Um, Lake Lanier is, and I should say Lake Sydney Lanier, there is another Lake Lanier in South Carolina. It's a large human-made re reservoir. It's located about 50 miles northeast of Atlanta, and it was created by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and officially opened to the public in 1958. 
It sits primarily, and you can kind of see on the map here, in Hall and Forsyth counties. There's also small portions of it that fall within Dawson and Gwinnett and Lumpkin counties. And the largest cities in the vicinity of the lake are Gainesville, which is kind of more to the northeast, and then Cumming, which is more to the southwest. When it's at its full pool level, the lake covers about 38,400 acres. And you can, again, see in the map here, it has a really irregular shoreline. There's actually over 690 miles of shoreline uh, with many inlets and coves. And then there's also a number of small islands kind of within the lake. And that has to do with how it was formed, which I'll talk about today. Originally, the lake was constructed for flood control and hydroelectricity and navigation. These were kind of the primary purposes that the Corps talked about um, and the legislature talked about when they were creating it. But now it's really known more as a source of drinking water as well as a recreation destination. So New South Associates, my company, was hired by the Georgia Department of Transportation to write a history of Lake Lanier. Um, this work was done as mitigation for the removal of a historic age bridge that crossed the lake. They're actually in the process right now of replacing all of the original 1950s and 1960s bridges that crossed Lake Lanier. And you can see um, kind of how we organized the context, the, the sections up here. Um, it's not published yet and, and available to the public, but hopefully it will be within the next year or so. Um, but today I'm going to try to answer the question of how did human impacts to the upper Chattahoochee River Basin create Lake Lanier and what is really under the surface of the reservoir? So Lake Lanier has really captured imaginations um, in recent years, and I think spoken to some deeper truths about the area and the area's history. You might be familiar, there's um, some TV and film adaptations that have either come out or are in the process of coming out. And so as a historian, and I have a picture of me here kind of in my happy place in an archive, I think I can bring a different perspective to this story, which um, a lot of what you see on, in internet articles and on social media kind of has an emotional truth, but is also spreading a lot of misinformation about the history of the lake and how it was created. So for this project, I visited a number of archives in person. I was at the Hall and Forsyth County Public Libraries, the Historical Society of Cumming and Forsyth County, the Sugar Hill History Museum, and UGA Hargret Library Archives and Special Collections. I also visited online a number of digital archives and I've tried to include some archival photos in the presentation to kind of reflect that work. So many people, again, um, in kind of this popular culture interpretation of Lake Lanier, they talk about a dark or troubled history of the landscape. And what this really goes back to is two major episodes of racial cleansing that took place on the land that would become Lake Lanier. The first of these being um, the Trail of Tears. So native groups were actually the first settlers, the earliest settlers in the area that's now Lake Lanier. In fact, Chattahoochee or the Chattahoochee River is an indigenous name coming from the Muscogee language and it means March rocks. By the time of European con contact in the mid 1500s in this area, bands of Cherokee were who had predominantly settled in the area and they lived together with early U Euro American settlers for hundreds of years in, in the area. In the 1830s, the U.S. government forcibly removed members of the Cherokee Nation from North Georgia along what became known as the Trail of Tears. One branch of the Trail of Tears National Historic Trail, which you can see kind of the bigger picture that there's many different, different branches, um, but one of them truncates at the western bank of Lake Lanier, which you can see in the inset here. And then less than 100 years later, um, in 1912, local law enforcement in Forsyth County arrested several Black residents on scant, very little evidence, um, and accused them of rape and murder. A white lynch mob murdered one of the men, and then two others were convicted and publicly hung. And they're actually pictured here in the newspaper photo. It's Oscar Daniel, who's second from the left, and then Ernest Knox at the far right. So in the following weeks following this incident, groups of violent night riders drove out all 1,100 Black residents of Forsyth County, many of them in this kind of mass 
exodus crossed the Chattahoochee River to settle in Hall County. And so I have a picture here at the bottom left of the Chattahoochee River in 1909, kind of just before this incident took place. And so when people reference the troubled history of Lake Lanier, they're usually referring to these incidents. They took place on the land that would one day be covered by the lake. So then in the decades kind of more immediately before construction of Buford Dam began, the area consisted primarily of false uh, of small farming communities along the banks of the Chattahoochee River. Um, some of these farmers had planted crops, others had transitioned to poultry farming by this point, and then others raised grazing livestock. And the landscape also had a number of rural churches and roadside stores and mills, as well as a modest highway network. Um, roads and ferries and bridges connected people on either side of the Chattahoochee River. So to the right here, you can see a map of Oscarville. It was a small unincorporated crossroads community, and it's often connected to that 1912 racial cleansing in Forsyth County, since it's where three of the accused men lived. Um, portions of Oscarville and then a number of other areas around Forsyth County where Black residents had once lived and worked and farmed are now under the surface of Lake Lanier. And so here we can see um, kind of the base layer here is the 1953 topo map that was done just before Lake Lanier and then an overlay of the blue being, being the lake once it filled and you can kind of see where it covers. In the mid-1950s, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers began to acquire private tracts of land in this area, and they purchased um, 56,000 acres of land and then displaced about 700 households and families who lived below the anticipated line where the water was expected to reach. Um, once these properties were vacant, the Corps got to work on removing and relocating these buildings, and they were mostly farmhouses and barns and other agricultural structures that were removed. Cemeteries were also located within the footprint of the future reservoir and hundreds of burials were moved. Um, some of the cemeteries and burials affected were connected to the local Black community. So for example, in January 1957, the Corps paid the trustees of Spencer Hill Baptist Church in Hall County one dollar. Um, it was an African-American congregation for their former cemetery, and then the Corps flooded the cemetery after relocating those burials. So thousands of people gathered on March 1st, 1950 for the Buford Dam groundbreaking. It took six long years of construction um, to, to build the dam. As you can see, it's a large earthen dam until it was ready to hold water. And then in 1956, they closed the gates. Um, as one local historian has kind of referenced this, this was really when Lake Lanier was born. And at this point, the reservoir began to slowly fill, um, which took about two years. As the lake began filling, many people congregated to watch the process. It was this big community event and it had a huge impact on the families and communities. It changed like how they navigated the whole area um, and how they were connected to each other. One significant hazard as they were filling the lake was trees. So they had the, the potential to snag boats and swimmers. Um, so the Corps halted impoundment in 1957 when the pool level was about 40 feet below, you know, what it was going to reach. And then you can see on the picture to the right here that boat crews went around and cleared trees and obstructions. You know, they cut them at this point so that once the reservoir was full, the trees would be far below the surface and they wouldn't pose a danger to boaters and swimmers. And then while the lake was move, was filling, the Corps also moved some bridges, they replaced others in the same general location, and then they constructed some completely new bridges um, to provide access across the, the reservoir. And so to the left here, you can see Wilkie Bridge, which was replaced in approximately the same location as the former bridge in that location. About the legacy of Lanier, um, you know, what is that? So initially, flood control and hydroelectric power were two of the Corps' main goals in creating Lake Lanier, as I mentioned at the beginning. Um, flood control was very effective. So today, downstream properties are worth about $2 billion, and Lake Lanier protects them from flooding. Um, in regards to hydroelectricity, Buford Dam's generators produce more than 200 million kilowatt hours each year, which is enough to power about 25,000 homes. 
And Lake Lanier also provides drinking water for local users. So um, about 100 million gallons of water a day are drawn from those communities immediately around the lake. And then another 377 million gallons of water are drawn um, from the Chattahoochee River below Lake Lanier and provide water, drinking water to the city of Atlanta. The regulation of water usage in this area has led to what some people call the water wars between Georgia, Alabama, and Florida, and legal battles related to who can use the water and how much are you know, very much still in the court system. As I mentioned earlier, recreation was not one of the initial primary goals for the reservoir, but it became very important. So by 1971, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers boasted that Lake Lanier was their most visited site in the United States um, with an annual attendance of almost 11 million people. And then that same year, the New York Times wrote an article that said that the reservoir was the most popular man-made man -made lake in America. Popular activities at the lake, and this continues to this day, are swimming and fishing and boating, and you can see pictures of those activities here. Vacation, uh, the rise of tourism drove development throughout what was formerly a very rural area. So vacation homes and choice lakeside lots were, you know, built all around the reservoir. Next came an expanded road system and restaurants and stores for summer crowds. Over the years, the area has really been absorbed into metropolitan Atlanta, and now many people live year-round in these subdivisions of bedroom communities around the lake and, you know, commute into Atlanta for work. For some people, this doesn't feel right for an area with such a troubled past. Um, people are now profiting off of land that members of the Cherokee Nation were forced to abandon in the 1830s and that Forsyth County's Black community was driven off of in 1912. So, is Lake Lanier haunted? Um, you won't find the answer to that in the archives, but they do show a very dark and troubled past that is now quite literally covered up. And it's our duty as historians to uncover that truth. So if you're interested in this topic, these are some additional sources that I would really recommend. Um, I use these all extensively for the project. Blood at the Root is particularly good for the history of racial cleansing in Forsyth County, as well as um, it also covers the Trail of Tears in that area. And then Robert David Coughlin's book, if you can get your hands on it, it's, it's out of print right now, as well as Deanna Gillespie's article are very thorough just on the history and impacts of Lake Lanier. So thank you all. And I've included my contact information here um, if you'd like to be in touch. Thank you.